Right, now, we're continuing to look at integration by substitution. Here's an example. I want you to think, before we get to this example, of what we've looked at integration by substitution so far. Um, don't need to write this down, but if you have a think about something like this, here's an example which looks remarkably similar of something we looked at before, and we saw that basically, if you do a bit of twisting and turning, you can use integration by substitution, and you can see this should turn into a sine inverse, basically. Um, you're going to need to muck around with the coefficient because of the 4 and the 9 there, but it's, it's not complicated. And when we were doing this by integration by substitution, a lot of you pointed out to me, well, it's a bit longer. Like, there's just a, like extra work rather than twisting this into a common form, saying let x equal etc, etc, etc. Ended up with, like, depending on the way you write it, um, two to three times more lines at least. That doesn't mean two to three times more work. Some of the lines were um, very easy to establish, like when you make a substitution and then you find out the derivative. Those are really, really simple. But all the same, the question was, why? Why approach this by integration by substitution when we already have techniques that will take care of this quite adequately? And the answer is, there are integrals like this one where the techniques we have like this, just trying to twist it around, are not adequate. So despite how similar these kinds of, of um, integrals look, this presents a much bigger problem. Now, before, again, one more thing I want to say before we dive into this particular problem. This is a hard problem. Uh, this is about as hard as it gets, really, in some ways, for um, integration in extension one. It's definitely extension one, not a two-unit question, because there's no boundaries. There are no boundaries. Now, you wouldn't think that having boundaries made that much of a difference, but if you think about a question like this, I've just turned what was a really hard question into a really easy question. This is very, very simple to solve, because as you know, if you think about what this shape is, this is just a semicircle, it's just a semicircle, and integration is all about what's the area underneath the curve. Now, if all I want is, uh, I can just draw it over on the side here. If all I want is the area of a semicircle, then I don't need calculus to work that out. I can just say, well, it's gonna be radius three, and I say, well, pi r squared in this case would be pi times nine, nine pi, and I only want half of the thing, so it'd be nine pi on two. And that's the answer to this. This is just a number, right? A definite integral just corresponds to an area. However, if you take away these, just this little small piece of information that's missing now makes this dramatically harder. So how are we going to go about it? Well, just like we've seen before, the key is to choose an appropriate substitution. Now, it doesn't look immediately obvious what substitution should be made. Okay, now I will point out as extension one students, you will very, very commonly be given the substitution. Okay, they'll say, just try this, let x equal this, and then see what unfolds. Okay, but before we, I actually show you, I want you to remember if it's a semicircle, right? One of the things that we learned about circles before is that you can represent them with, with x's and, and y's, but you can also think about them parametrically. You can think about um, a, a point on a circle in terms of an angle like this and the, um, and the radius that you've got there, okay? So being that we understand things parametrically, or at least we can, and sometimes that is useful, is not that crazy an idea to say, well, can I use parametrics to help me here, okay? Now, remembering that on the unit circle, every uh, coordinate, and I'll just use this one, every set of coordinates on the unit circle is cos theta, sine theta. Theta, sine theta. This is not the unit circle. This circle is, um, is, is bigger than this. It has a radius of three. So therefore, the parametric coordinates for this are not uh, cos theta sine theta. They're going to be three cos theta, three sine theta. Now when you have a look at this, I can use that. I can use that to my advantage, right? Instead of saying, um, let's just think about this in terms of x's and y's, I'm going to introduce well, let's, let's introduce a theta into this, okay, um, in the trig function. So in this case, um, a particular example I'm gonna try, is I'm gonna say, let's let x equal c three sine theta, okay? It'll be an interesting exercise for you to see what happens if, let x, if you let x equal um, three cos theta, but as I think you'll see as we go through this proof, it doesn't make that much of a difference, okay? 
I'm gonna try this out. Now there's the first piece, if I use that, I can start changing the function there, but I also need to see um, what happens to that variable of integration. I've got a dx there, I need a d theta. So what am I gonna to use to translate back and forth between those? I'm gonna differentiate. Now, even though we, we're used to differentiating with respect to x, that's because usually x is the independent variable. It's the thing over here on the right-hand side. Um, you've got something which is a function of x, but I've done a substitution here. It's not a function of x anymore, it's a function of theta, so that's why I'm differentiating with respect to theta. Okay, now, sine simply turns into cosine. And this, this is good, but how do I use this to get rid of this dx? Well, essentially what I want is for a d theta on dx to appear in my uh, equation over here. Because then I can multiply through by that, and the over dx will cancel with the dx here, and I'll be left with everything in terms of d thetas. That's what I want. It looks to me like the easiest way to get, it, get the um, dx on the denominator is to divide both sides by dx on the theta. If I divide both sides by that, the left hand side obviously just becomes one. And on the right hand side, being that I'm dividing by dx on the theta, that means I'm taking the reciprocal. So that's d theta on dx, right? One on dx on the theta. So this is good. And as we pointed out before, the reason why this is useful is because now I have the left hand side as one, I have one everywhere. Like I can substitute one into whatever I like and that's exactly what I'm going to do. So now that I've got these pieces, that's all I really need to start translating this thing. I just said that nine minus x squared is gonna be nine minus this squared. So I'm gonna go ahead and make that substitution. And now you can start to see why this isn't just plucked out of nowhere. This is going to become something useful for me, right? Uh, I've now got this guy, but I'm going to cancel him with that. So I will put all of the pieces in place so I can do that. I've got my d theta on dx, and then I've got my dx that was already there. Okay, so you can see these two guys going to cancel with each other, so they disappear. And as I do that onto the next line, I'm going to do a bit of simplifying here as well. Think carefully. I've got uh, an integral. I can take out a factor of the square root of nine, which of course is just a three, but it's outside the square root. And then under here, I have one minus sine squared theta. One minus sine squared theta, I of course know, is cos squared theta, which is true for all values of theta. Then what's left over here? I've got three cos theta, my dx's have canceled, so I'm just left with d theta. This is really nice. Where can I go forward from here? I can take out the three squared there, which gives me a nine. But then I'm going to pause, okay, because it's a simple thing to say, oh, the square root of a square is just whatever that thing was, right? The square root of the square of three should be three, right? Except we know, we've looked at this before, that the, uh, the square root of a square number, the tricky thing about it is if you put a negative number into here, if A would say a negative number, when you go through this process of squaring and taking the square root, you don't end up with a, if a was negative, you're going to end up with the absolute value of a. Okay, and this is something that we um, we looked at briefly when we were doing inverse functions. That uh, because you don't get an inverse function when you just do um, the taking the inverse of the square, you get an inverse relation. We had to strictly define the square root as positive only. So this is what's going to happen over here, right? It's a very very common error to just say, oh, the square root of cos squared is cos. It's not. It's the absolute value. Okay, now this is a little bit awkward. Does it matter? And the answer is, yes it does. I'm gonna quickly illustrate to you why. If you think about uh, what this graph looks like, what is this? Because I've changed this question now, right? We looked at this and we thought, ah, oh, semicircle. We look at this and think, what on earth is that? Okay, well, it's the product of two functions, okay? So I can consider the two different pieces and see what happens when I multiply them together. Cosine, I know what that looks like. That looks like, oh, I'll do it in green. Let's just do it from north to two pi. I can keep going, but I'm gonna get everything I need here. That's what regular cosine looks like. What would the absolute value of cosine look like? Well, everywhere that cosine is positive, the absolute value of cosine is just cosine. Right, so this blue dotted graph is my absolute value of cos theta. But then in here, as we're familiar with from all the other absolute value graphs that we've drawn in the past, what happens is you get the reflection across the axis, right? So you're going to get 
this kind of shape here. Now, this is weird, okay? But we can deal with this. I'm now trying to work out what does the graph look like? And it's this times this. Now, as extension constants, this is a little bit outside the scope of what we're doing. Um, you know, compounding functions together and multiplying them. But we can still work this out, and extension two students should be able to do this in a lick. Let's let's watch this, okay? What I'm gonna do is think about some important values here and then see what happens when I multiply them, okay? I'm thinking about blue times green, right? This is my blue graph, this is my green graph, so I'm gonna multiply them together and that will give me the whole function. There are lots of easy values to start with here. Um, blue times green, when um, theta is equal to, this is the theta axis, when theta is equal to zero is one times one, which of course is one. Got some other easy values here, zero times zero is zero, zero times zero again, one times one. Then it starts to get a little more interesting. When theta is equal to pi, that's halfway along the graph, right? I've got this value, which is negative one, because that's the range here. And then I've got this blue value, which is one. Well, negative one times one is negative one, okay? Now, what does the rest of this thing look like? This is something that extension two students can have a look at. Extension one students don't have to worry about graphing something this hard. Uh, for the sake of it, I will just quickly show you. It should look roughly like that. Okay, and if you wanted, you can use some calculus to help you with that. The important thing about this is not the curvature, the concavity, or anything like that. The important thing, <coughs> excuse me, to note is that parts of this graph are negative. Now, that's kind of a problem, right? I don't want this to be negative. Now, how do I know? There's a couple of different ways to resolve this. I'm going to show you one, a simple one to begin with, which appeals back to this. When you have a look at this um, original function, right? Again, I don't have any boundaries, but I know it only exists between negative three and three. And no matter, no matter what boundaries I were to choose, no matter what values I put in here, the area underneath this curve is always going to be positive. Of course, assuming I'm going from small values to bigger values. If you integrate backwards, that's another matter. So being that what you've got here, this thing here, whatever values you're going to put in here, you should expect something positive. It has to be. Every part of this graph is above the axis. So when you take an integral, you should be getting everything as a positive area, right? Therefore, I've translated the problem into this. Well, in exactly the same way, I ought to be expecting that every part of this should be positive. But there's parts of it that aren't, okay? So therefore, I can ignore this part that gives me a negative, right? What was it that gave me a negative? The problem was this, this blue part up here. I know it thinks, you might think it's this um, green part because that's the negative bit. But really the issue is, were I to take just regular cos squared, just regular cos squared, which is just the green graph times the green graph again, a negative times a negative is going to give you a positive, right? It's the absolute value that gives the problem. So therefore, I can say, since this is going to be positive, right? This has to be positive for all real values of x that actually satisfy this integral. Therefore, this must also be positive, right? So I can take the positive case of cosine, right? So it's going to give me this. Okay, so I guess my argument for that would be, since the original integral has to be positive for all the values for which it is defined, right? So since this guy is positive, which is the integral I started with, this one also has to be positive. I can ignore the negative case, right? Um, of course we know cos theta would equal negative cos theta, uh, sorry, the absolute value would equal the negative sign if I was thinking about what happens over there, but I, I'm not, I don't want that negative case, I just want the positive one. I think we can all agree, just like every part of this is positive, every part of this will also be positive. When you're putting real numbers into this, you can square it, you'll get something positive out. Okay, now, that was the hardest part, I think, of dealing with this, because from here, this is actually a familiar integral. Um, we dealt with this back when we were doing um, the calculus of trig functions, let alone inverse trig functions. But let's go ahead and finish it off, because this, we're still not out of the woods yet, even though we've done the hardest bit.